everyone. We are live. Okay. <laughs> so hello everyone out there in Facebook world. My God, 2020 is almost over. <laughs> uh, this is uh, our last webinar Zoom, I hope, even for the year. I can't remember how many we've done. We've done at least 20 uh, live instructions uh, on sharks and conservation. Uh, several with Ben Smith of Blue Endeavors, who's one of our guests here. Uh, and this is our discussion on shark science, art and adventure on Facebook Live. So hopefully we'll have a lot of people join us and they can put questions or queries, be nice, uh, in the message uh, box. And with us tonight, we have my good friend and esteemed colleague and board member, Pamela Ordeñez Comstock, who is the artistic director founder of Art for Sharks, as well as being a big ocean advocate. Welcome, Pamela. And she's going to head off first. And then we have Vince Smith, another good friend, shark conservationist, founder, director, CEO of Blue Endeavors, which is a conservation organization, as well as dive organization and education and great partners. We'll talk a little bit more about how we can get you all hopefully virtually in the water with us or literally in the water with us in 2021 to uh, describe and understand and protect these charismatic and endangered species, primarily focusing on manta rays and hammerheads. And then we'll have Dr. Gary Rose, who is a physician, medical doctor, uh, in barometric medicine, mer emergency medicine, I think, uh, mass or d dive instructor, underwater photographer, man at large in the ocean, and he's <laughs> going to share uh, some shark biology, physiology, science, and hopefully some of his incredible photographs that he's shared with us on the Art for Sharks Instagram, as well as our artforsharks.org that Pamela will tell you about. And finally, there's me. I am the director and founder of Shark Stewards. Hi, uh, I'm a marine biologist. I love sharks. I didn't start out being a shark lover so much. I actually studied environmental toxicology and worked in ocean health in various capacities for the government, for Cal or UC Berkeley. Uh, and then I quit to save sharks after experiencing and witnessing and documenting shark finning in the South Pacific. And I became a documentary filmmaker, made Shark Stewards of the Reef, helped uh, support a new film festival called the International Ocean Film Festival, now in its 18th year, and went on from there trying to advocate for shark protection, uh, reducing the wildlife trade and stopping it if we can and protecting their habitat. And in the corner, <laughs> we have one of our board members, <laughs> Medea is sporting burn, hello. <laughs> Uh, and I thought Jeff was going to tune in too, because somehow my board members always kind of get in there because they're strong supporters. So uh, it looks like we're going live. I see us on Facebook. And uh, let's start with Pamela, if you want to share your screen and tell us about Art for Sharks. Sure. Okay. Um, first of all, I'm going to share my screen. Bear with Okay, so this October was very special for many reasons, um, very different for many reasons. As the world knows, we had a pandemic um, in process. So Sharktober was the first Sharktober of its kind. We had to do everything from behind video screens, dis social distancing, very difficult to celebrate Sharktober for those of you who don't know what Sharktober is, it's that time of the year where the sharks are more active in the Bay Area. And Sharktober, Sharktober was coined by David himself, as you may well be aware, and has grown into a worldwide event where people become very focused on shark activity and become more aware of their presence in the Bay Area, particularly in the Bay Area because of the season and the time that they come out here and do their thing, whether, whether they're feeding, um, mating, 
uh, David would be able to tell you that better, except for I just know that there's more sharks in the water during October, November, December months. So for October, it's such a big, big time. We usually have art shows and art galleries and events. This time we had to be really creative. So instead of doing an art show with an auction, David asked me if we could do it online with artists. And we started to think about this because of COVID-19. We started thinking, how could we make this really important and really special? So we decided to start Art for Sharks. And Art for Sharks is a very special forum where we invite special artists who will do art uh, which is focused around the ocean, mainly sharks, but it doesn't have to be sharks. It could be anything to do with water. It could be a painter who wants to paint a drop of water, the river, a waterfall, um, anything to do with water or sea life, palm trees, um, jellyfish, anything to do with water. So we thought, why don't we do a show in October online? And then it kept growing. We thought, why don't we make it permanent? So we, established Art for Sharks. And so this October was very special because we launched Sharktober Art for Sharks and David saved, made sure it wasn't taken. We started an Instagram and we are blowing it up into a website, which is in process. But right now you can go to Instagram, Art for Sharks to find all our art. So I have um, about maybe eight minutes left in my section. And I would like to just share with you a few of the artists that we've had when we first launched it. We wanted to invite artists that were very passionate, again, about sharks and just about the ocean in general. And we wanted to let everybody know that the artists are not with us just for October, but they're with us for life. So we will always carry their art. We will always sell their art. Um, a percentage of their proceeds goes to shark stewards, which we are so grateful um, to them for, but we're just so excited because I am so passionate about art and I love art. Art is my life. So David was able to give me this opportunity to gather artists that I love, share their art, and then also be able to give back to the ocean and save sharks. So it was just wonderful. Gary Rose, who's one of the presenters here, is an amazing photographer on top of being a doctor, and he is one of our artists. So he was um, amongst our first artists when we first launched it. So you'll see his name. So I'm gonna go ahead and just scroll through Instagram and just show you a little bit of how we show art. We want our art to look like a gallery. So our art at Art for Sharks is presented in a very beautiful way as if you walk into a gallery and you're just oohed and awed with the most amazing art and you just wanna buy everything you see and hang it up in your walls. So we started with seven painters and photographers and a sculptural artist and an illustrator at heart. So when we first started to do this, we realized that we needed to tell people what we were doing. So we're doing art to raise an awareness, support a cause. So we encourage all our friends and family to visit and support Art for Sharks. And again, we wanted to tell everybody that it was not just October, it was forever. So October and beyond. And pardon me while I move my little cursor here and find the screen that I want to get to. Sorry if the scrolling gives you guys a headache. Not at all. Okay. The first artists that we introduced um, were very special. Three were from Hawaii and most of them located near coastal, um, coastal living places like Gary Rose, he's in Florida and he lives there on the beach. Mark Cunningham is a world-class um, diver, a, a, a body surfer, absolutely amazing body surfer. You, If you know of body surfing, you'll know of Mark Cunningham. Peter Shepard Cole is a very established artist on the North Shore. His father is a world-class big wave surfer. Ian Shive is, um, he wrote, he is, he's published books on amazing photography. Um, is it National Geographic, David? I believe it is. We have a book that we 
presented for Ian Shive. Gary Rose is a photographer who you will hear more about his lectures tonight. Peter DeBoer is from the Netherlands. He is a painter, beautiful painter. Um, he'll do surf scenes, campsites, palm trees, um, surfers in the lineup. Kevin Mursky is a local Marin artist. He does whimsical illustrations. He'll do people doing funny, quirky things like surfing while uh, holding a cup of coffee. Sarah Phillips is an Australian artist. She's absolutely amazing. You'll see her illustrated um, and watercolor sharks all over our site. Kaoli Komsok is a landscape artist. He's based on the North Shore. And then there's David McGuire. He's also a photographer. So if it's okay with you guys, I want to just kind of share with you on the screen some of our artists. So this is Peter DeBoer. And if for every artist that we talk about, we will give you a little bio. So if you want to dig deeper, you could read about them and read about who they are, what they do, what they love and where they're from. And I'm drawn to Peter because he will paint something like this. I mean, just beautiful, beautiful art, gouache, oils, um, acrylics, and just paintings that take you away, um, make you feel like you're surfing, make you feel like you're there that day with the sunlight. Just absolutely beautiful. His paintings are, are around $1,400. They ship from the Netherlands. Expensive, but something that is a great investment. He'll paint things like this absolutely beautiful with the colors. There's pinks and yellows radiating in the light. And it's really like how you see it when you're out there. This is Mark Cunningham. Like I said, he is a world famous waterman and he will dive, dive, dive deep. And what he does is he will find artwork. He will build his artwork from pieces of, of trash that he finds in the ocean. This is a, a common theme in a lot of artists. And he'll do stuff like this. He'll take fins that he finds at the bottom of reefs and repurpose them and create artwork from them. And he sells them all over Hawaii. For Art for Sharks, he did this, this beautiful piece. It's called Black Kappa. And he arranged all these fins he found at the bottom of the ocean, put them on wood and it's for sale. And then Kevin Mursky is the illustrator I told you about. He'll do amazing, really simple illustrations like this. Beautiful, just from his, from his brain, we'll just come up with the most simplistic illustrations that you really can't wait to see the next thing he does. Really beautiful and simple. That's him. Here's Gary Rose from Highland Beach. Hope I'm not going too fast. And he will take beautiful images like this. And if you just follow the Instagram, um, if you read the Instagram, it will tell you how you could purchase it. All the art is online and it's, it's all very, very easy to buy. We put you direct we put you in direct contact with the artist. So you could actually talk to the artist. You could actually ask them questions. You could call them on the phone. I mean, it's really, really intimate and really, really special. It's really like walking into a gallery. This is Sarah Sproston, excuse me, Sarah Phillips. She's from Brisbane and she does, she did this, she did the most amazing artwork for us. She did the, uh, Healthy oceans need need um, sharks. I'm I'm not I'm not saying it correctly. I should I'm going to find it for you right now. She painted this amazing um, painting, and it's been sort of this thing we've been showing quite a bit. Healthy oceans need sharks. So Sarah Phillips did this for us, and it's been she actually did it. She was inspired by Ocean Ramsey but she actually offered it to us. And it's just really been amazing. I actually have, I actually bought one from her and it's a, it's, I framed it and it's a beautiful watercolor that's reprinted that looks like an original. 
and it's just beautiful for $25 from Australia. It's, it just makes a beautiful gift. If you go through the website, you, you will find the most, uh, excuse me, if you go through the Instagram, you will find the most beautiful artwork. This is Peter Shepherd Cole, and this is a painting. This is not a photograph of actual water. He calls this monster mush. So you can come to Art for Sharks to see the sharks, to see the paintings, to see the artists. And when you come here, you also know that you're buying art with a purpose. You're here because you love the ocean. You're here because you want to save sharks. You're here because you want to support artists. You're here because you want to save the sharks. And it just was such an honor to be able to do art for sharks and offer it to the public and be able to show people what art can do for sharks, like sharks don't realize it, but we really are helping saving them. Every dime goes to shark stewards and everything we do, we, we're here to fight to save for the, for the longevity of sharks for another 450 million years. So I could go on and on. I have so many more artists, but I hope that you guys will visit Art for Sharks and soon we will have our website more up to date and you'll be able to go to our website too for those who don't like to go to Instagram. Um, but right now we're on Instagram for Art for Sharks and it's been so much fun to do this with everybody. I'm always open to suggestions. Um, but right now, I think I need to turn it over to Vince at Blue Endeavors. <laughs> Thank you, Pamela, that was great. And there's also a Facebook page, Art, Art for Sharks. And we had the first nine artists and we're gonna put the additional, what, eight artists? So it's really exciting how it's grown. Uh, some really beautiful works and thank you for the brainstorm, the great idea and all the artists for contributing their talent and passion. Welcome. Thank you. That was great. So now Vince Smith of Blue Endeavors is going to talk about diving with, with manta rays and yeah. how do we recognize them? <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you so much, David, for actually inviting me to this great panel. And I'm excited to see all the other uh, work from all the other artists, too. So I'm, I'm excited about what you're doing here. So yeah, tonight, um, I, I really wanted to talk about kind of the projects we're doing at Blue Endeavors and just diving in general. Um, diving with these beautiful giant oceanic mantas, diving with hammer sh hammerhead sharks, whale sharks, in places like Socorro is really one of the most magical uh, experiences that any diver can have underwater. Uh, it's, um, this is from our last 2019 expedition. We're on one dive uh, around Roca Partida. We had seven giant oceanic mantas around the students and two whale sharks on just one dive. And the behavior was incredible. This was one of the, the more fun uh, experiences, kind of just watching manta behavior where we had this smaller black manta that kept touching and, and following this other manta. Um, I'm sure maybe David, you could explain this behavior <laughs> or maybe Gary, uh, it, it looked a lot like play to me, but perhaps it was some kind of courting behavior. Uh, so really for, for anyone, like I said, th this is really, I've been diving since I was a kid and places like Socorro, Cocos, where you get to spend time in the water uh, with these animals is really just a, an unbelievable experience. But at Blue Endeavors, we wanted to take that even further. And so with all our expeditions, we have a project and the project as Vicki Fong, who's an intern at both Shark Stewards and Blue Endeavors, coined the term volunteerism. And the idea for our high school students and the idea for really for all our citizen scientists, basically anybody that's a diver that wants to dive with a purpose, we have projects on all our expeditions. And so that's what I wanted to really talk about tonight is, is how much you get out of actually giving back to the oceans and how it could really allow you to be part of the solution. So the project that we have works with all megafauna, but we are starting with the, the giant oceanic mantas for a few reasons. Uh, one, this really started off back in 
2015, we were working with Rodolfo, who's a Mexican marine biologist on the Nautilus boats. And he was having our students collect data on the giant mantas. And the and it's in a very traditional way. So as you can see by this photo, we have one of our students has a underwater slate in his hand and his dive buddies taking a photo of that manta. And really what they're documenting is they're documenting the temperature of the water, the depth, they have GPS location from when they drop down, they're estimating measurements and they're taking the photos to really identify that individual because back when we were there with Rodolfo, he was mentioning that there's a lot we don't know about these animals just from a lack of data. For example, something simple, like how long do they live? At the time, we didn't know that. And what makes these animals really ideal for study in, in the first phase of our project is the unique spot pattern that they have. So by getting underneath a giant manta, like you can see in this photo, that those spots are like a fingerprint. So they're very distinctive and you're gonna be able to identify that species and the data that you're gathering, I'm sorry, not that individual, uh, and the data that you're gathering and, and look back and see maybe other divers, other researchers who have, have seen this individual before and where else was it in the world? You know, where, what, and you could start to really with that data, get a, a better understanding of their behavior and um, and really how we can react to the situation. The, the other thing that makes them nice to study is uh, they actually come to you with their, they have these amazing personalities, these giant brains. Uh, I love this shot. This is one of our students from 2019. Uh, and, and I still don't know if she's saying, you know, look, that's close enough, stay back because <laughs> she didn't want to get, or she's trying to give it a high five. I, I honestly can't tell. Um, but the, uh, again, the spending time in the water, if anybody has ever had the opportunity, um, the mantas are really there to interact with you. I mean, we've had this experience time and time again, where we have the same three individuals that we're spending the morning with, we get on the boat, have lunch, they, they swim away, and we jump back in the water and they come right back uh, to engage with us. So it's, again, magical is not an overstatement when you're in the water with these animals. But collecting data in this way is not easy. So um, if diving in a place like Socorro is, is challenging, um, a lot of people have brought up even, you know, the fact we're taking high school students without even task loading them with collecting data to Socorro. For a lot of people, they were surprised at that. And, um, and our students are up for the challenge. I think everybody has done phenomenal, but once they're out there and we start putting slates in their hands and we start, it is a lot uh, for them to handle. Um, things like their buoyancy, and you're talking about an area where there is no bottom, the bottom's thousands of feet down. Uh, their buoyancy maybe suffers. Uh, maybe they're not paying as much attention to equalizing their ears. So it is really difficult working in this environment. And that's kind of a limiting factor for, for a lot of people. And the other limiting factor to collecting a lot of data is that a lot of people on their vacation, they would love to contribute, but they also want to just be taking photos, kind of having an interactive experience, maybe not spending so much effort on actually collecting the data. And in this day and age, one of the things we thought of a few years back was trying to apply modern technology to this, to come up with a simpler way to do it. So really what our project is about is about one, getting students exposed to traditional research methods to actually have them go out, do the, do the research, start growing these databases for these wonderful organizations that collect this information. But then also can we take um, and improve with modern tech? And so we, uh, in 2019, we prototype tested an iPad where we, the concept of this project is we're gonna apply facial recognition software, which we were calling facial recognition software to the, the mantas. So that instead of us on the boat through a photo flip book, trying to figure out, is that the same individual that someone saw years ago? Uh, we could take advantage of modern AI. And the hardware around that would include, uh, would include hardware that we could one, take information off of our dive computers. So as I mentioned, we want things like depth, temperature, a lot of data that naturally dive computers are collecting anyway. 
we also wanted to use the compressed air from our scuba tanks to put a little air underneath a membrane in a house tablet. So that way we could use the tablet underwater still. And for measurements, uh, we wanted a hardware or a little trigger mechanism that would shoot laser beams at the animal so that we'd be able to take more accurate measurements. And we had a prototype a couple years ago. Um, it, it was a good experience for the students to see the prototype process is not always successful. Uh, so we've had to go back to the drawing board to come up with a better version for our next expedition out there. But it's, uh, it's been a great experience for the students. And one of the things um, that I get asked a lot about is just what, what is it like to take 20 high school students out in the middle of the ocean for a lot of people? Uh, they're terrified by that idea. And uh, I, 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 all I can say is I've had nothing but amazing experiences. Uh, so this is another shot with the, with the students uh, in, in Socorro. And what I liked about it is we really did show that they, they probably make about the best dive buddies that you'd ever see in the water. Uh, they, they do stay together. Um, but you do also have to watch them. This is at Roca Partida, which is basically just a giant rock in the middle of the ocean. And I look over and saw this one student just kind of drifting backwards into the depth and uh, casually swam over to him to find out what, what was going through his mind. And it turned out he just wanted to take in the awe of this giant rock in the middle of the ocean and the, the pelagic animals swimming around it. So, um, so it, it really has been a pleasure taking students on these trips. And really the big reward for us, this is a, a quote from one of our students who was on that trip. And uh, it, we really have seen with a lot of these students that in, in the past, they're kind of inundated with these messages about all the problems in the ocean. And so fundamentally, we wanted to just go out there, start hands-on doing something. And students have really responded to that. And what I mean by that is it's, for some of them, it's changed where they go to college, what they're thinking about going into. A lot are going into maybe policy or marine biology or choosing careers because when, when you actually do something beyond just recreationally diving, it not only has the same hands-on experience where you're now connected to these animals and connected to the ocean, but you also do feel empowered that, yeah, you can get out there and, and make a difference. And so that's always been one of the most gratifying things for us. I mean, we're really working on creating this worldwide network of students that are working together collaboratively to crowdsource the problems of the ocean. And I mean, there, there's so many things that the oceans are facing, but in reality, there's a lot more of us, of people and people that care. And if we could really uh, empower everyone to start their own organizations, get on research projects, make a difference with their, their recreational time, uh, we could really start having a, an exponential impact in a positive trajectory. So yeah, that's a little bit about our project and what we're doing with the mantas, which we hope to then scale to other megafauna like the hammerheads, like the whale sharks, like the great whites. Great, well, you neglected to say, unfortunately, another COVID casualty was our our shared manta expedition to go down and actually do what you're discussing this coming June, but we're hoping to do it in 2022, right? Yeah, we, we unfortunately this project, when I was saying we're going back with a, with a second version of the prototype and with students, it's definitely going to be happening, but unfortunately due to the, the pandemic, we've had to push that back. Yeah. But if you are interested in getting involved, definitely reach out to myself, reach out to David and, uh, We'll, we'll get you out there with us. So you can reach Vince through blueendeavors.org or probably info at. Or yeah, Vince info at, at or Vince at if you want to get directly in or touch. Or David at sharkstewards.org. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll be on a boat together. Mm -hmm. We're all sitting here longing to dive with these beautiful animals and, and understand them. I had a question actually, and somebody in the message box was asking about, yeah. uh, you know, there was a quite a bit of conversation and concern. And we, we did see it here in California where people with spare time or not working because of COVID were going out and fishing and actually encroaching in marine protected areas. And we know this is true down in Galapagos and Cocos, but we were fearful of, you know, Reviajeros, uh, some of the other pinnacles where these uh, charismatic megafauna 
are are aggregating and apparently your contact said that they seem to be doing fine down at least at Socorro and Roca Partida. Yes, yeah. So we we go uh, with the Nautilus live aboards. Mike Lieber is the owner who, for the last decade, has done a lot to support conservation in, in especially with sharks. And so I reached out to him when they first, and they've just recently been able to start running the charters again. And I reached out to him with that exact concern, and was uh, pleasantly delighted to hear that anecdotally they've seen no difference. They've been having just as many interactions and seeing the same amount of biodiversity as they did pre-COVID. So um, with the reports from the boats, it's, it seems like that hasn't happened in that area, which is great news because that was a, a major concern of everyone's. Yeah, so, and it'd be interesting going to Roca Partida because the last time I went a couple of years ago, there are more and more dive operators and people don't really understand, but these sharks are really shy and they're afraid of bubbles especially. And so you go down to take a photograph and there's another dive group and it doesn't really have a chance to reset. And a lot of times these are cleaning stations. And so the sharks go down deeper and you can't see the sharks. And that actually probably impacts some of the energetics or maybe the cleaning of the sharks. So it's probably a great opportunity to get out there with fewer dive operators and better diving. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Great, thank you, Vince. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Gary Rose, uh, an extraordinary waterman, scientist, and uh, doctor, and diver. And he's going to share some of his photography, which he's generously donated some works to our Art for Sharks. So Dr. Rose, please. All right, thank you. Can you hear me OK? OK, first. Uh, Vince, interesting. I dove Socorro last year at Rudolfo, and I learned so much from him. And I'm happy to say, now that the vaccine's out, we are going on Nautilus this March. I'm, I'm leading a group on diving medicine for doctors out there to get CME credits. And I'll give some photography hints uh, March 4th through 12th. And I'm looking forward to seeing Rudolfo again. Uh, I'm going to talk about hammerheads. To me, the most fascinating of all sharks. And I have a little bit of time at the end. I, did upload some slides of the uh, giant mantas, the chevrons and the blacks from Socorro, so I can go over those a little bit. So I'm just gonna give you kind of an overview of, uh, man of um, now why won't this advance? Uh-oh, let's try over here. Ah, all right, sharks are basically eating machines. They're cartilaginous, they're not bony. They have a very strong, uh, can you see my cursor okay? Okay, uh, spine to support their tail with lots of muscle and a huge stomach and liver, and they process food. They're very, very, very um, efficient swimmers because these denticles have these flutes on them and they capitate air. So what happens as they, not, I shouldn't say air, oxygen, as they fly through the water, these, this fluting and overlap causes it to become more like a, a bubble bath so they move through a much less dense environment, hence the speed that they have. And I'm not gonna go over the senses that we know they have smell and sight and hearing, but I wanna show you some of the special things that sharks have and all of them have. First, they have this thing here that's called a nictitating membrane. And those of you who dove, ever dove with hammerheads or with tigers, you see that it looks like their eye is rolling up in their head. It's not. This membrane, as they're about to bite down to protect their eye, this membrane comes up and covers the eye. The other really cool thing they have is what's called the uh, tapetum lucidum. It's a layer right behind the retina that when light comes through, it bounces off the retina, hits this tapetum lucidum, and back and forth, back and forth, and it amplifies it. So sharks see the way we do with nighttime vision goggles. And that's because of this tapetum lucidum. Uh, the other exciting things they have, one, they have a lateral line system as do all fish, but in sharks, the lateral line system is extremely sensitive. So when there's movement in the water, pressure waves from divers or other fish or fish that you spear fish and they start wiggling like that, well, you can't see there, they start wiggling, they can feel the pressure changes. But for me, the sense that makes, pardon the pun, the most sense, which is given to sharks 
you see it looks like their eye is rolling up in their head. It's uh -oh. not this I don't know why we're repeating. So anyway, uh, they have what's called the ampulla of Lorenzini. And these are wrapped around all shark species heads. And what they are, they read electromagnetic waves. So when you're in the water with them, your heartbeat, your heart rate, they know it. They can perceive your brain waves, the electricity, as you've ever seen an EEG, they know your brain waves. So if you're a stranger to them, they're reading you and they're learning about you just by this electromagnetic energy. Now, where I dive here in Jupiter, which is the most amazing place to dive, it's my backyard. I go on safari every weekend. I'm diving with tiger sharks, hammerheads. We had a great white out here last week that my friend Jeff Joel photographed. We have scallops, we have silkies, we have duskies, and we have the best aggregation of lemon sharks and bull sharks in the world. But those sharks, when we go in, they know each of us by our magnetic signature from our heart and our brain. So we go in, the various sharks that recognize us come right over to say, hi, how are you? You're not supposed to touch them. And we frown upon it, but sometimes they want a little bit of a head rub to get some of those copy pods off. So here we can see those ampule of Lorenzini that are wrapped around the snout. In hammerheads, uh, all the photographs are my, uh, I've taken, uh, they have this huge cephalofoil that the entire surface is covered with these ampulla of Lorenzini. And cephalofoil, by the way, means head wing. And you can see it's like a big wing. They're particularly amazingly adapted because with this huge amount of ampulla, they're able to read the electric the magnetic fields that are coming from the rays that are buried under the sand and the other prey that they go after they read, they can find them under the sand. Now, speaking of the cephalofoil, I just found this study uh, about the hydronet dynamics of the hammerhead cephalofoil. We were all under the misguided knowledge that we thought that the cephalofoil was like an airplane wing. And when the, when the hammerheads would swim through the water, it would give them lift. Absolutely wrong. And this study that just came out in September in the scientific reports shows airflow studies. And you can see right here, the flow above and below the cephalofoil is the same. Unlike in an airplane, you'll see increased flow above in, in contradistinction to below, and it, that gives it lift. They don't have that. And here we can see in every area studied above and below, there's no difference in the speed of the water flowing over the cephalofoil. So they don't get lift. It's just there so they can have lots of ampulla of Lorenzini to detect the uh, varied rays. So let's talk about hammerheads in general. Uh, here in South Florida, we basically see uh, hammerheads and scalloped hammerheads. Occasionally we see bonnets and smooths, but I'm gonna talk about what I see and know. So to, to identify a great hammerhead, there's a few identifying features that you will never make the mistake again. And I do give lectures on shark ID. First and most prominent, no matter how murky the water is, how bad the visibility is, you can always see the huge dorsal fin. On a great hammer, the dorsal fin is always at least as large as the girth of the body. Anything less than a one-to-one -one relationship is not a great hammerhead. So you can see these things way off in the distance and know it's a great hammer. There's no other animal in the water that has such a large dorsal. The other thing that distinguishes the great hammerhead is the pelvic fins. These are the pectoral, this is the anal, this is the caudal, but the pelvic fins have a sickle shape. You see this very crescentic shape. Only great hammerheads have that. And then lastly, the cephalofoil is large, almost straight, and it has what we call crenellations, and those are their indentions. So huge dorsal fin, curved pelvic fins, and crenellations. And here we see exactly that. Here's the curved crescent. Here is the huge dorsal, as big as the body, and the head doesn't matter as much. Versus scallops, you'll see the dorsal is much smaller compared to the body. It's usually about two thirds of it, or two and a half and two thirds. And the pelvic, the posterior border is straight. And then on the cephalofoil, the crenellations are bigger, and there's more of a curve to the head, as we can see here. Here, the dorsal is small, is less thick than the body. And we can see very clearly how the posterior border 
of the pelvic is straight and the curve in deeper crenellations. By the way, something I noticed and I forgot to mention years ago is on the heads of great hammers and on scallops, the bulb, the, the dilation where the eyes are acts just like the winglets that you see on jet aircraft. It decreases the turbulence to give them more efficiency in the water. So a little bit about photography. There's a rule in photography underwater, get close. The closer you are, the better you can, you have less water between you and the animal. There's less filtrate, there's less whale snot, there's less larva, and the, there's more light that gets, bounces off. So once you get close, get closer. So that's the first rule of underwater photography. The other rule, especially with sharks, is never take your eyes off the animal. Uh, a lot of sharks, oceanic white tips, hammerheads, great whites, tiger sharks are ambush hunters. Once you take your eyes off of them, they see you as fair game. So learn to shoot without looking through the viewfinder. I, I snuggle in behind my camera so I can get an idea where, where I am, but that's the other rule. So this is my working position. I like to have my strobe set very close, about a hand width away, at the same level as my, my dome. And this is my working distance lighting for between like one foot and three foot. And most of the photographs I take are no more than three feet away. Therefore, the water column has less stuff in it. I can bounce my lights off and get much more efficient photographs. If something's between three and six feet, I move my strobes out a little bit. I happen to use a Nikon D500 and I use Nauticam housing and Inon Z330 strobe. It works for me. And really, as much as we work on buoyancy for ourselves, you need to work on buoyancy for your camera. You don't want it to be heavy and act as a weight, and you don't want it to be buoyant and float up to the surface. So work with your camera shop and work out the, what you have. I can let go of my camera anytime it stays exactly where I leave it, no matter what depth I'm at. If I'm a little further away, especially in tropical waters, I will bring my strobes up here at 10 to two. It lights up a bigger area and I will turn the power up so I can get more energy bouncing off. This is between about six and 10 feet. Again, notice my eyes are on the subject, never through the viewfinder. And then lastly, if I'm on shipwrecks and I'm on ultra wide angle, I bring my light, my strobes out as far as I can, turn the power way up, open my f-stop and let the light bounce off. But you have to remember to work on particulate and that's something that is it, when I give my photography talks, I go in more detail, but I don't have enough time tonight. The other thing is positioning. I took these photos of my friend, Jeff Joel. This is the guy who just got the picture of the great white off of Jupiter. Notice his position. Same working distance of the strobes. He's about three feet away from this um, sandbar shark, and he's not shooting through the viewfinder. Eyes on the critter at all time. Positioning, see the working position of the strobes, and he's holding this at hip level, and you get a feel for it. It's like a shotgun. You don't have to sight a shotgun. You just hold it and you get a feel with the ultra wide angle. You have to be a little clever. He knows that this sandbar is about to come underneath him. So he pulled his knees up. Uh, this is another shot where um, Jenny, the tiger shark is coming over him. So he just leaned back and got out of the way. And again, this is moving your body around. The sharks are not gonna pose for you. You have to be in the, optimal position for them. Uh, here's one of my favorites where literally he's spreading his legs way out so the shark can pass in between his legs and he can get the shot he wants. Uh, this is one of me, it's the only one of me shooting, but you can see you have to have good buoyancy control for this silky shark and this bull shark. But you see my legs are higher than my body, but my camera is always lined up to get the shot. And then if you're really good, you can balance on the dorsal fin of a bull. Of, actually, this is a, uh, you know, this is a bull. And you see how he's balanced right on the fin to get the shot. I'm just kidding. It's just, it was just lucky I was able to get this really cool photo. So a little bit about hammerhead. So here's the cephalofoil. Uh, this is one of my favorite shots. This is in Bimini. Hammers hang out on the bottom. Here are the winglets I was talking about. And it's just creating a little bit of a sandstorm. Uh, I love trying to get open mouth shots and it's all about timing. If you're using a compact camera, there's always a delay between pushing the shutter and the shutter actually opening. But with a 
a crop frame or a full frame, uh, what you see is what you get. Uh, this is another area that in my photoshops I talked about how to get cathedral lighting. You can see the divers lined up, but I just love this. This is fireworks and it works in black and white also. Uh, this is one of my shots that I use when I give quizzes uh, and I ask people to identify this. And people have the hardest time unless they remember that the dorsal is so huge. But this is a hammerhead, but it was perfectly lined up that you can't see the cephalophore. Uh, this is my favorite photo of hammerheads. I've sold a lot of these on my website, which is GaryRosePhotos.com. GaryRosePhotos.com. I'll give myself a plug. And also through Art for Sharks, I've donated this uh, photo, and I've had a few buyers already for this one. It's nice and subtle color. And it's also really cool in black and white. really pops out. Uh, again, showing positioning, getting Snell's window, which is very hard to do at the same time of properly lighting your hammerhead. Uh, again, here's Snell's. This photo took me a few years to learn how to take this, to get the proper touch of lighting from my strobes, but yet not overexpose Snell's and the sun. And what's better than a hammerhead? Two hammerheads in clear water and bimini. This photo is very interesting. I took this photo about a year ago and I kept going back to it. I couldn't understand what is it about it that bothers me. And it really is a disturbing photo if you know hammerheads. And the reason it's disturbing is this eye looks like a great white shark eye, black death. There's no life in this eye. And I couldn't figure it out because hammerheads don't have black eyes. And I finally figured it out. I just gave it enough light that here we are seeing myself, that's my head, that's my strobe being reflected off the eye of this hammerhead. So now I'm gonna go out and try to reproduce this picture and see if I can actually do that. Uh, this is the, um, the big shot, the feeding shot where you get the hammerhead with the big cephalofoil with its mouth wide open. So I thank you. If I have a few moments, I'll just run through very quickly some manta shots. Uh, Vince, uh, this is at uh, the boiler uh, in Socorro. This is a giant black manta and the lava flows behind it, 21 foot wingspan. This is a hard photo to get because there's a lot of stuff in the water. You have to be able to position your strobes at the right distance angle so you don't get the particulate between you and the giant manta. Here, this one is also at the boiler uh, and you can see the layers of the volcanic rock flowing. Uh, this is uh, some of the remoras of the giant black. Uh, Snell's window, silhouette of a chevron. And here we see the classic shot of the giant manta, the chevron style with the big remoras about 21 feet across. Blue water, as Vince mentioned, this goes down to infinity. And just a few shots of the mantas. And anyone who wants to email me or contact me, Pamela can do that through Art for Sharks. And I'll be able to tell you what kind of things to do to be able to get these type of photographs with this color saturation, being able to catch the waves and pick up the IDs on the mantas. Uh, here we see a diver approaching a manta, swimming just beneath a manta. And those are just a few manta shots. So uh, if there's any questions, I can take them now. If not, email, chat. Uh, Pamela can give you my number. Again, I'm doing the Socorro trip March 4th through 12th. We will be COVID ready because the vaccine will be out. Uh, for those people in the medical fields, it's a write-off with 10 CMEs. And thank you very much. I hope to see you there. Thank you, Gary. Wow, some great biology in there and amazing photo tips too. So Thank we you. had a question, one was, what is Snell's window? Snell's window is, if you notice shooting up, you were able to see a circle of light where you see the waves and you, you see the sun peeking through. Most photographers, when they shoot up, they get a silhouette of the animal and they burn out Snell's window. It's just like this white flash. What you do is, and I'll, I'll tell you what you do and then what it is. You have to put your f-stop uh, to about F14, F16, turn your ISO down to 100 and get your film speed to about one to 250. Always set your photograph up for the environment. So I'll take a few practice shots with nothing in it, just to be able to get the right settings if I'm shooting up, sideways or down. 
then when the animal is, comes into view, you should be ready for it. You don't look for the animal and chase it. You wait till it comes where you are. Always, as Vince mentioned, they come to you. Always, they will come to you. Then you set your strobes for whatever lighting that you're used to using. So for that kind of photograph, I'll set my strobes about one eighth their power. Then you see that circle of light above. You can see the sun concentrated. You see the little wavelets and that circle is called Snell's window. It's just a nice vignette form. Great, hey, yeah, cool. Well, some really beautiful work. And it's Thanks. nice that you live there in Florida where the water's pretty clear and also pretty warm, much warmer and shallower than well, that's, there, uh, like Socorro. That, that's a matter of right now, I'm, it's cold. The water's 73, that's cold. Yeah. And with the wind blowing the way it's blowing, it's uh, not so clear, but I'm hoping by this weekend it'll clear up. Hey, people on the West Coast don't want to hear you say that's cold. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I have a one millimeter or three millimeter, a 3.4 open cell of five and a seven. I'm still on my 3.4 open moving up to the five. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the water's about, what, 51 off of Monterey. Uh, I've never only done that in the cenotes, and that was very, very difficult. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you. And you can go to GaryRosePhotography.org, is it? GaryRosePhotos.com. 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 And of course, Art for Sharks. Art for Sharks. I have all of them there. And I prefer you go there because that way, Art for Sharks, I've donated 50% of all purchases uh, go to Art for Sharks. Okay, great. Well, um, there was one more question and I don't know the answer. Somebody, Dan asked if all hammerheads have sickle shaped anal fins. And that's a really specific question. <laughs> um, that's a very good question. Was, did he mean anal fin for sure? Pretty much. Uh, on the great hammerheads, they have the sickle shaped pelvics and the anal is very sickle. But if you look at the, um, scallops the anal is not as much of a sickle it still is a little bit but you, you don't use that for differentiation okay and there's about well there's eight species in the sphere in today and one in the uh what is it yes yes i forget the the bonnet heads are a different genus there's two genera in the sirena day of the so that's, bonnet that's head. a good question speaking of the bonnets they were very they are very prolific in the middle keys and they're moving up. They're, they're being seen a lot in Miami and they've been spotted now in Fort Lauderdale and Boca. So that's uh, a- Okay. Really yeah, I, actually mis I misspoke. I meant the UC Fire, the winghead sharks, which are oh. the most basal of the, the group that we call hammerheads. And they have really big, big cephalofoils. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what their anal fins look like because I've never seen one. I don't either. But their fins may end up in Hong Kong. So that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit is, is uh, conservation and advocacy, because that's what Shark Stewards does. Uh, we're a project of the Earth Island Institute, which is, which is an international organization working in environment and environmental justice worldwide, based in Berkeley, California, right across from my alma mater and where I used to work for the biology department at UC Berkeley. Uh, so I'm an educator, but I try to apply that education towards conservation and the future. And, and that we focus primarily around shark conservation as well as rays, but additionally protecting where they live. So establishing marine protected areas, uh, shark sanctuaries, national marine sanctuaries and state marine reserves like here off of the West Coast of North America. So not only protecting the sharks, but also protecting the sharks and applying citizen science as well as volunteers through divers, through students to collect data and also to advocate for long-term protection. Um, Gary talked a little bit about the senses. There's six, it's actually kind of considered a seventh sense, but this diagram came out of my recent book for kids because I've, we've been really focusing on youth education and not only here in North America, but also in so Southeast Asia uh, and in China. So this, this, this uh, area of rings just showed a, shows, not for all sharks, but uh, generally the carcharhinids like the hammerheads that show 
uh, the lateral line, which Gary talked about, the eyesight, the sense of smell, uh, and um, the closer you get that electromagnetic field through those ampullae of Lorenzini. So sharks have a very sophisticated toolkit and uh, they're highly adapted. And it's, they're not just uh, using their sense of smell or the sense of taste, they're using all of these other sensory input in the environment, doing what they do best, whether it's eating the dead, chasing the sick, removing the slow, and creating a healthier ocean and gene pool by keeping the quick, the smart, and the healthy. So it's important to have sharks in those ecosystems. They've been around, as Pamela said, over 420 million years uh, as a cartilaginous fish line. And let's try to keep them together as well as humans so we can coexist on this planet for another few hundred million at least. So hammerheads and, and uh, mantas. Why hammerheads and mantas? If you look at our new logo, uh, we've been focusing on shark conservation since 2006 when I quit my job at UC and primarily looking at the shark fin trade, but also fishing policy globally and trying to reduce overfishing. Early on in the, uh, uh, the 80s, when I was in college, there were vendetta hunts on great white sharks off of our coastline. It nearly extirpated or caused local extinction in the population. They've now been, uh, they've been protected both in the state of California as well as federal protections since 1993, and now we're seeing that population recovery, uh, recover. So formally our, our symbol for sharks was white sharks uh, because they're kind of a rallying symbol. People understand what a shark is when they see a picture of a white shark, but it has a lot of negative connotations that ride along with it, uh, generated by Mr. Spielberg and, and Jaws and some of the other spinoffs on television. So our focus now really is to try to intervene and interdict in the endangered shark fin trade. And many of which these species are nominally protected internationally by protections such as CITES, the Convention of the International Trade of Endangered Species, uh, Federal Endangered Species Act like we have in the US, uh, uh, Center for Migratory, or, or migratory uh, Regulations at our UN Convention uh, and other uh, jurisdictions such as Central America, Mexico, and in Southeast Asia, because these populations are crashing. Scalloped hammerheads, it's been estimated, have lost 90% of their population in the last 50 years due to bycatch on, in tuna fisheries and swordfish. But in the last couple decades, they are the most coveted for the shark fin trade. As much as 5% in Hong Kong are hammerhead shark fins, despite being protected despite being illegal to trade without a very extreme permit and permission under CITES. And yet they bring the most money and that represents a couple million sharks a year. There may not be a few million hammerheads in the shark, in the shark uh, kingdom left in the oceans. So this really is getting to be a critical time to protect these sharks, particularly sharks like this that are very vulnerable to these areas where they aggregate. So photographers could get in the water and get close because they're either cleaning stations or they're feeding and breeding areas. And they also migrate. Um, one example is what we call a hammerhead highway between Cocos and uh, Central American coastline of Costa Rica, Panama a little bit, uh, uh, down to Colombia, Malpelo Island and Ecuador. Uh, so the Galapagos, which is a little bit south of Cocos Island also uh, has this exchange along these seamounts and fishermen know this. These sharks are protected in these islands in these UNESCO world sites and uh, government protected regulate, re regulated no fisheries areas, but we've seen a lot of poaching over the years. And in the past few years, we've seen hundreds of ships coming uh, primarily flagged from Taiwan and China to catch not only sharks, but they're out there for squid, uh, other forage fish, tuna, and not only are they fishing in this area where my cursor is, between the national protected waters of these Central American countries, uh, this is Colombia down here, but also inside, encroaching inside the protected zone of the Galapagos and Cocos. 
So the proposal is to close off this area to any international fishing, particularly intercommercial fishing, so that not only will these countries have a livelihood of their own, they'll also be protecting these breeding areas, they'll be protecting these sensitive species, like the giant manta rays, which also migrate, uh, the sea turtles, which also migrate, and especially these hammerhead sharks, which are following these annual migratory uh, patterns that these guys are sitting either wet raiding to pounce on them or are going dark, turning their transponders off and fishing illegally, showing up two weeks later offloading their fish or are turning their, their transponders off and fishing inside the zone and then going back into these loading zones to transship. Uh, if you want to go to our website to learn more about that, just look, just Google Hammerhead Highway. We have a petition to the presidents of uh, Ecuador and Costa Rica, and there is an international coalition, including many Central American partners and, and also here in, the, in North America to try to protect these species. Manta rays are particularly fascinating. They're a highly evolved uh, kind of ray. Uh, they are in their own family, the Mobulidae, they used to, used to be considered their own family, but they are cousins to the bat rays here off of California, also the eagle rays. Uh, they can be highly acrobatic. They are filter feeders. They have this uh, mandibular extension here that helps funnel the plankton in, so they eat the smallest plants and animals and fish larvae, and yet they can become massive. Uh, 1,000 pounds, 19 feet across. And if you've ever had a chance to dive, dive with one, it's just mystical, it's magical. It's, you're flying like an eagle, that's so incredible. They are so gentle. And their behaviors, as Vince said, are, are very different. So the giants tend to be more singular. They don't aggregate as much. Sometimes you'll see them paired up. They will gather around feeding areas like Socorro, Roca Partida, uh, but they don't aggregate as large or as in largest groups as the, uh, as the reef manta rays, which you see all through Southeast Asia and the tropics. The, the uh, giant manta rays are more uh, sporadic, it's more spotty around the globe, and also that they are also highly uh, targeted and coveted for their gills to make traditional Chinese medicine. So these dried gill rakers, uh, are, these brachial plates are being used for, they're ground up as a medicine. It's uh, hundreds of dollars per ounce and they're using a various, a different, various products and it's associated with curing many maladies including respiratory disease, which ironically because of the increase in air pollution associated with the increase in industrialization, capital, capitalism and wealth, uh, in China, you're seeing more respiratory diseases and you're seeing more of a demand as well as the economic ability to pur purchase these products, which add an additional burden on these populations. So also with shark fin soup, which was the, the dish of the Song Emperor and emperors to follow and a few nobility and other rich people suddenly became available to the middle class, upper middle class for traditional uh, banquets, weddings, celebrations, including uh, the Lunar New Year coming up. And it's really a matter of supply and demand. There's far too many people wanting this dish and there are sharks to supply it. And we're seeing sharks all over the world, like this one taken off of Indonesia, being killed for their fins and increasingly for their meat as well as other fish populations decline. Uh, this is a trend that's, that's uh, concerning globally for all marine megafauna, meaning all large fish, sharks, whales, uh, and also sea turtles, but sharks especially are at threat. And also the ecosystem services as well as species that are associated with sharks. So this study that came out last year shows that if 19% at the current rate of extinction, 19% uh, of sharks will be extinct in another 20 years. And a 40, 40, 40, as high as 44% decline in other species associated with those sharks. So if we save sharks, we're saving the ocean. Uh, if you protect a shark, you're protecting small fish, you're protecting a reef, you're protecting an algal ecosystem like the macrocystis off our coast. 
Sharks as apex predators keep the ocean healthy and clean. And what do we need more now than anything? We need health. We need healthy oceans. We need healthy people. And we need hope. And there is hope. So working with Dr. Sylvia Earle and Mission Blue, creating these hope spots like off San Francisco and our Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary, uh, Costa Rica down at that Hammerhead Highway, all, all the way across the, to the Indo-Pacific in Timor-Leste this year. And these areas are areas where people can come dive, they can come learn to appreciate, and also working with local people and scientists to protect it in perpetuity. So young people, instead of eating shark fin soup, can actually jump in the water, learn how to dive. And I mean young Chinese people. So we are working with uh, young Asians in Shenzhen, when we can go, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, and trying to educate them. And they go back home as ambassadors and they are becoming active. They're, they're, they're concerned about plastic pollution. They're concerned about air pollution. They're concerned about losing wildlife and they're becoming motivated. We wanna feed that. We wanna bring our films, our photography, anything we can do to share the love that we have and inculcate that into them. This means respect, not only respect for sharks, it means respect for all of us. And that means across cultures as well. So what inspires me, what gives me hope are these kids. I get random emails or photographs uh, and, and they send movies and they go running for sharks. Like we have a run for sharks every year and they're inspired, they're passionate and they wanna protect them and they wanna come see them. Or young men like this guy who's a multi-generational fisherman who's now training to be a dive master in Timor-Leste and he'll make more money that will continue to pay his salary as long as he protects some of those manta rays which we saw right out here outside of his village. So there is hope, I think is especially hope among divers. We're always encouraging our volunteers to dive in, save a shark, count a eel grass, do a reef transect, take a photograph of a manta, contribute to citizen science, do surveys in marine protected areas and add to that scientific database, but also add to that scientific experience base and share that science and love. So I saw Dan Valentine was on, and I think, I hope he's still listening because these are our two volunteers of the year, uh, uh, Katerina Santagava in Cape Town, is our web designer. She volunteered to design our really cool new webs. I'm sorry, she volunteered to design our new logo, which is a, a hammerhead and a manta, which really represents to me the, the beauty, the sanctity, 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 the yin and the yang, the predator and the basal consumer, the peaceful sharks, the peaceful rays. Uh, the most beautiful animals in the ocean that we need to protect. So she did a beautiful job on our logo and also some of the graphics on our website. But Dan did all the heavy lift, lifting in the architecture, among other things, data collection, uh, data mining, uh, graphics for a new film we're making called Jin Yu on mercury and fish targeted at healthy fish and unhealthy fish for Chinese to eat primarily, as well as us Occidentals. So thank you to these great volunteers. We are a volunteer organization. We have hundreds across the globe. We are international from Canada to Hong Kong, to Singapore, to Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, trying to inspire people to get in the water and collect data, appreciate and don't kill and share that love. So unfortunately with Blue Endeavors, we are hoping to go this year with students and do this uh, photo pattern ID. Gary gets to go. Uh, I'm still hoping to go some way by hook or by crook and get back down and try to document some of this fishing in uh, the central uh, East Pacific, as well as get across to some of the new areas we've been working in Indonesia. So I want to give a shout out to our partners in Indonesia who formed this dive center. They're limping along, but thanks to a grant from Blue, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, from um, Oh my gosh, I'm blanking on <laughs> Ken Smith. Um, we got a, a grant from, God, I'm, this is bad. Uh, a dive magazine that'll come to me. <laughs> and it, it all went to support these people on the ground to keep the uh, poachers out of the house reef 
and to uh, survey sharks and also to do patrols. And so you can go to Lombok where there is a protected area and a new, another area on the other side of the peninsula where we're seeing manta rays, pelagics, uh, like hammerheads and even whale sharks and trying to create permanent protection. And we're employing citizen science and, uh, and volunteer scientists and people can learn how to scuba dive, but they can also learn how to do these surveys and participate in long-term conservation. I wanna thank my board here because they are my guiding star that help shark stewards, not only with our vision, but also trying to support us financially. We do have a matching donation that's still going right now uh, that we're pretty close to on a GoFundMe. And of course you can support the work through the, the photographers on Art for Sharks. Thank you, Pamela. And uh, you can follow us on National Geographic Field Notes, who I write for on Instagram, of course, our website and here on Facebook. So I wanna thank everybody uh, who's participating, who's listening. Uh, if you want to volunteer, you can go to the link on our website. If you wanna join us on one of the Blue Endeavors expeditions, go to, to blueendeavors.org. Uh, we have several petitions where you can actually take action, including one that's due January 7th to save the Point Reyes National Seashore from uh, polluting our National Marine Sanctuary and our state, our Drake's Bay National Marine Reserve, Reserve. So you can take action now and have hope, get out of the water. Let's, let's get together in 2021, save some wildlife, uh, educate some kids, tell people don't eat shark fin soup for Lunar New Year, eat lower on the food chain, and let's all focus on loving each other and our own health and working together for healthy humans and healthy oceans. So I wanna thank you all. I don't know if we have any other questions. Uh, maybe one of my board members has a question. We have one, part two on board. Pamela or anybody have any additional comments? We kind of a little bit over, but that's okay. No, thank you. I loved hearing what Vince and Gary had to say, and I loved seeing um, what you had to say. It was really nice. Thank you. And, uh, I'm looking for art to see. Oh, go ahead, Vince. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say, if we um, come across some artists that want to get involved and donate some art, should they just reach out to you directly to get sure. involved in the project? Yep, they can DM me or um, email me or the best way is through Instagram and they could send me a DM. Okay. Just send it to Art for Sharks. I'll read it. Great. I am uh, absolutely looking forward to seeing David's book. I, I saw some of the graphics tonight. You sent me a little bit of the book without the graphics a few months ago. Oh, I'll you, send you one. I, I'm so looking forward to for seeing it and then selling it so that you guys can make some money. But it's a, ah. look, absolutely terrific. And I like the stats that are in there. It's good to know. Thanks. And we're hoping, I I pitched a, a, sorry, Gary, did I stuff on you? Not, not at all. I muted myself. I, uh, I pitched them to do, uh, to do a book. This is a, a science book for kids. It's on our website and on Amazon. It's called uh, Sharks for Kids, a, a junior explorer's guide. And we have one on sharks. Now we want to do one on the other sharks, what we call the flat sharks, which are the rays and the most species in the elasmobranchs, and also the chimera, the ghost fish. So that's what I'm working on, as well as a guide on the 30 coolest sharks of California and uh, ex adventure stories. And that's uh, hopefully going to come out on Hay Day Press this year. And I want to give a shout out to Undercurrent Magazine, where I had my little brain fade there. Ah, and Ken, Ken gave a, 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 a shout out. If you can go to Undercurrent um, on Facebook, you can see what a great magazine it is. It, it's a really great dive magazine. It brings together the dive community. They also have a, uh, what's called a chat book. It's a diver's guide in print. I don't know if he's going to print it anymore, uh, but uh, it's a great online newspaper that or news whatever you call an online newsletter newsletter 
uh, that really goes in depth about either, for example, the, the tragedy that happened with the, the conception off of California with the loss of life among the dive community. Uh, it talks about traveling, it talks about equipment, it talks about medicine. So it's a really great resource. So thanks for Undercurrent for not only donating the 5,000 that we're matching now, but also, uh, and that 5,000 goes to source, goes to the Indonesia lab. Uh, and also uh, he gave a shout out for the book and I ran out. <laughs> I, I had a hundred orders and I, I'd never experienced this. And then also, you know, we have beanies and hats and I'm like, oh no, I have to wait for the book. So finally got another couple hundred. Um, so I'll send you one, Gary, happy to send you one. And Thank you. Undercurrent is a great magazine because it reports things. It doesn't editorialize and it's not advertising. It actually tells his information. And, and I really appreciate the, the medical information in there as well. I've seen some really, have you written for it? I have not. I have an article actually coming out in the first quarter in, in the Alert Diver. Yeah, I've seen uh, And, and uh, it's coming out. And I also have, I just submitted another one. Right? It, it's a it's a new area I'm branching into is underwater medical writing. <laughs> ah, well, I've seen your work in Dive Alert, Dan's magazine, yeah. or Alert Diver. And that's a really great, great magazine. And that's the course that I'm giving in Socorro, and again in July uh, in Guadalupe, uh, diving medicine. But it's not geared for at the level of techno techno technical doctors. I mean, people, all the people are on the liveaboard are invited to attend. So they get some really interesting and helpful information. Great. Well, we'll look for that. Wish I could go. I do too. It's, on, it's on Nautilus. Well, my seminars are on Nautilus. Mike Lieber is a very generous man. Great. Okay. Well, thank you to all the panelists. Thank you for all the listeners, all the people who commented, asked questions. Uh, you can Find us here on Facebook and Instagram and all that other stuff. <laughs> but in the meantime, I would like a day without screen time. I don't know about you. I love you all, but I've had the most saturating last couple of weeks. Uh, it's been fun to teach, but not as fun to teach live. I miss the kids. Uh, I miss the college students that I work with. Um, I miss the, our public events, our Sharktoberfest events. I miss diving with my friends. Uh, and so hopefully in 2021, Let's get over this thing and let's have a really great new, uh, the next 10 years, next, next millennia. Yeah, let's go diving. <laughs> let's go diving. Thank you, Medea. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to sign Thank off. You. Bye. Thank you, Pamela. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>